Greetings comrades, you know my last couple of videos have been pretty grim. Killer plants, destructive habits. Today let's discuss something that's not trying to kill Russians, but something that makes them stronger. And no, this is not another vodka video. It is time to break some cultural walls. In this video I'm going to tell you about 8 traditional Russian drinks that are still popular in Russia today. And yes, some of them are quite unusual. This video would probably look even better as a cooking vlog, but hey, I don't want to take the bread out of our dear Boris's mouth, so you'll have to do without witnessing my amazing culinary skills. But each beverage will have a little story to go with it. And after watching this video, you'll be ready for anything people might try to get you to drink when you go to Russia. Let's get started, from the least weird drinks to the most weird ones. Perhaps the most famous traditional Slavic drink, which is popular not only among the Slavs, but also among the Balts. Although something similar to Kwas was around in ancient Egypt, at least Herodotus in the 5th century BC mentioned a drink for the preparation of which one had to soak bread crusts. Kwas is made of rye bread and is actually low alcohol, 1 to 2 proof, but nobody really cares. It is universally considered a traditional Russian drink and is known in Europe as such since 1553. At that time, not everyone was even aware of the fact that somewhere in the East such country exists, but they still knew about kvass. At the same time, each region of Russia had its own secret ingredient of kvass. In Karelia they mixed kvass with wild berries, in Voronezh they used to throw in horseradish root or dill seeds, and in Astrakhan they added watermelon juice. And if the first two variants seem quite normal to me now, the third one is… Uh, questionable. Kvass is also notable for the fact that it often becomes not only a separate drink, but also the basis for the classic Russian soups – Akroshka and Batvinya. And while many foreigners are okay with drinking kvass, kvass-based soups can actually horrify some of them. Another drink we share with our neighbors, this time with the Scandinavians and their famous miot. Actually, miot and midavucha are different drinks and the former was more popular in ancient Russia, while midavucha came to replace it around the 18th century. For the longest time, the largest producers of traditional miot were, of course, monasteries. But why did Midavucha replace its ancestor? Well, simply because it was much cheaper and faster to produce. The period of maturation of true miot in barrels should be from 15 to 50 years, and who was ready to wait for so long for some drink? Only monks were. So at first honey was diluted with water and boiled with fruits and herbs. The cooking time was reduced to 2-3 weeks. Such miot was called varioni miot, which is basically boiled honey. In the 19th century, people came up with an even faster method. According to it, honey does not ferment itself. Water, yeast and hops and sometimes pure alcohol are added to it, making the process much faster. But the taste, of course, also has suffered greatly. Now you probably won't find authentic mead in Russia, and even boiled honey will be very hard to find. But there is plenty of midavucha to go around. Another drink based on honey, which has survived the test of time, unlike its predecessor. Zbitin was prepared from honey, spices and herbs, and was distinguished by the fact that it was served hot. Basically, people drank kvass in summer and zbitin in winter. Moreover, before the introduction of tea to Russia, zbitin was basically the only hot drink known among Eastern Slavs. So you can imagine how popular it was. So popular that there was a special profession, Zbitinshik, a guy who knew how to use a special ancient samovar to prepare it. The traditional recipe is as follows. Dissolve honey in boiling water, add spices and boil for 30 minutes, and then serve with various sweets and pastries. By the way, this is the traditional Zbitin mug, which has reversed edges. It is done on purpose, so people won't burn their lips while drinking it. I think Zbitin resembles honey-mulled wine more than anything else, just without alcohol. 
Shocking, I know. Yes, that compote. Strange as it may seem, the word compote itself is of French origin, although the drink is not popular in France at all. But it is wildly consumed in Central, Southern and Eastern Europe. Compote has been historically used simply as a way of preserving fruit for the winter season. In fact, it is just different fruits boiled in a lot of water, sometimes with the addition of spices, which were preserved and closed in jars for the winter. Compote was very popular until the 1980s, but in recent years the very idea of canning has become less and less popular. People are drinking fruit juices and soft drinks instead. But even today, there's nothing better than a glass of compote on a hot summer afternoon. But only if it's not dried fruit compote. To this day, the worst memory of my childhood is a dried fruit compote we were given in kindergarten. Huge pots reeking of dirty socks with some mixture of raisins, prunes and other dried fruits boiled in them. A disgusting abomination. A drink very similar to compote, but still very different from it. First, instead of fruits, it contains berries, often those that grow in central and northern Russia, mainly lingonberries and cranberries. They are either boiled with sugar or honey, or simply mixed with water. Along with mead, morse is one of the oldest Russian drinks, and perhaps even one of the oldest in the world. You must agree that it is very likely that somewhere along the line some of our hairy ancestors probably tried mixing the juice of berries with water. It seems logical. Morse has a much more sour taste compared to compote and contains less sugar. In addition, it is full of organic acids and mineral salts. Its recipe is not lost, you can find the Morse in almost every Russian restaurant or just on the shelves of any grocery store. Many cultured milk products produced by fermenting milk are extremely popular with all peoples of Russia and the surrounding area. The main technological feature of making fermented milk products is, well, fermentation by introducing cultures of lactic acid bacteria or yeast. There is a great variety of such drinks, and each of them differs in some way. For example, kumis, which is popular among Asian peoples, such as the Yakuts. Traditionally, it is made from mare's milk and aged in a special leather vessel, made from horse skin. And for the best result, they put the dried tendon of the horse's front leg into it. Don't ask me why exactly the front leg. In the Caucasus, on the other hand, tan or matsoni are popular. The main trick in making matsoni is to heat milk up to 90 degrees, but in no case let it boil. And if you add salt and water to the resulting matsoni, then you get tan. Why would you add salt to the sour milk? Well, don't ask me, ask the Turks and their national drink Iran. In fact, it's the same tan, only with a different name. By the way, a similar recipe is popular among the peoples of the Central Asia, only with camel milk. Ethnic Russians also have fermented milk drinks, but they are somewhat less extravagant. Kefir – traditional drink with a consistency and taste similar to drinkable yogurt. Prostakvasha, which is a more thick soured milk product, or Ryazhanka, which is obtained by fermentation of baked milk. Fun fact, in the 19th century in Russia there were several medical clinics in which the main treatment was kefir, made on a milk fungus brought from somewhere in Tibet. Russian doctors used this kefir to treat rickets, lung diseases, gynecological diseases, anemia, oedema. I don't know if it really helped, but hey, at least it probably tasted good. Another drink that was known under the name Berezavitsa even to the Skiffians, but over time has undergone many changes, ceased to be alcoholic and became extremely popular in the USSR. Actually, birch juice is the liquid that flows out of the cut and broken trunks and branches of the birch tree, due to the root pressure. Our ancestors left this liquid to ferment, and after that the Berezavitsa was obtained. In the USSR, birch juice was consumed in its pure form, sometimes with some sugar added. 
It became popular in the post-war years, when nutritious foods were in short supply, and the juice was cheap and easy to produce. Birch sap has to be collected only at the break of winter and spring, when the sap moves intensively. In fact, the technology is very similar to that used by the Canadians to produce maple sap, which then becomes their famous maple syrup. A single birch tree can yield up to 7 liters of juice per day. In the USSR there was an industrial production of cheap canned birch juice poured into 3 liter glass jars. A glass of sap cost 8 kopecks, it was the cheapest juice available. At the end of April an annual festival of birch juice is held in Russia, near St. Petersburg, in the framework of which a battle of birch juices and syrups from different countries was once held. The winner, oddly enough, was the Canadian juice. By the way, it is not necessary to drink birch juice in its pure form. One could make birch wine, birch beer or even birch kvass from it. The taste of these products, however, is even more unique than that of birch juice. Perhaps the most controversial Russian drink that makes some foreigners go wild. Do you think Holodets is strange? Then let me introduce Kisel, a gelatinous substance, slightly more liquid in consistency than Holodets gel or molten jelly, made from starch, but with the taste of berries and fruits. The combination sounds not very appealing, right? Nowadays, the most popular Kissel is basically a morse, only thickened with cornstarch or potato starch. But our ancestors made Kissel from grain, and it was not sweet at all. It was not even a drink, but a complete meal. In ancient times, they fermented a mixture of oat flour and then ate it hot or after cooling. Kissel was a daily dish, but also was used in some religious ceremonies, like funerals. Everyone from peasants to tsars enjoyed it. It was an analog of porridge, pea, oat, rye. In Russian fairy tales, there is a strong connection between Kisiel and the world of the dead. The hero usually enters the other world and sees the rivers of milk or honey with the banks of Kisiel. Nowadays, Kisiel is usually made from ready-made mixtures with cranberries, cherries and red currants. Nobody questions its taste, it's a hot sweet drink with a taste of berries. But the texture, not everyone is ready for it. Even Russians themselves are divided into two categories. For some, it's the favorite flavor of their distant childhood. And for others, it's a gooey, disgusting, inconsumable nightmare. Do you have the courage to give it a shot? Can you handle it? Go ahead and try.